Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Voice in the Hollow. I'm your host, Miguel Ortega, and this is my co-host, Tran Ma. Hello. Today we have a special guest. We're going to have a DJ from Undertone Effects joining us. Uh, so let me just pop him in here real quick. So DJ, how's it going? Uh, up, what's up, happening? How's it happening? <laughs> So uh, yeah, we're we're happy to have uh, DJ. We uh, are big fans of the stuff that he's been doing with Action VFX. Um, oh. Our project has uh, what's it called? Uh, the Ultimate Fire Pack Volume One. Is that something that we're using a ton, in particular in um, some of our sequences? So for those of you that are joining for the first time, what we're doing is just uh, showing the breakdown of an animated horror Swahili. Uh, short film every week showing the progress of how we're doing everything from modeling to texturing to look dev to uh concepts to editing to sound to music and dj here is going to be the effect side of it so we're going to jump in with dj in a little bit but right now we just wanted to fill you guys in with some of the stuff that we've done this week so a big thing was we wanted to get a, a quick teaser out for people um, so we were able to put this out. So let me play this out in a second. Nina nguvu, mimi nijua. Nina nguvu, mimi nijua. Nina nguvu, mimi nijua. So we were very happy with that. We just had to crank that out. And we wanted to keep it very short and very vague because it is a short film after all. So we don't want a one minute trailer for, <laughs> it's for like a five minute short or one six fifth minute of, short. Yeah. One fifth of a short. So we kept it super tight. And uh, some of the action VFX stuff is actually in there. You can barely see it, but some of the embers and stuff are definitely uh, in there. Um, so that, that was a good thing. We put that online. It got a ton of views um so we're happy with that and then uh on the other part the other side tran and i have been working primarily tran has been working on just refining the chase uh sequence so uh it's still not finished but we've added some sound uh, yeah design. i'm still i'm still working on it <laughs> but you'll see uh we relit a lot of stuff and relayed out a bunch of stuff from uh last week and uh, there's a lot of cloth simulation now on all the shots, and uh, there's shot modeling now on all the characters. So, well, there's still some missing. There's still some missing, but a lot um, of the ones, basically, the clothing looks like it's simulated. The shot modeling is done, so the shoulders and all the deformations will be correct. So, let me just play that. Uh, so, this is just a work in progress of our intro chase sequence. So that's that. And one of the things we've been working on, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, some of the amazing students at Noman help us out. So they're jumping in uh, to, I'll show you. Let me just pull this up. Give me one second. Um, So Misha and Dakota, two uh, current uh, Noman students. So uh, this is one of the things they're working on, which looks, this is Dakota. And you could see how in the anteater shot, when it uh, falls on the ground, right now it, it currently just looks like he's falling over like a poly surface. It's not really yeah. interacting. But here you could see it's deforming the ground. And as he's kicking around, he's kicking up all this dust. You could see the wagging of the tail and everything is actually deforming the surface. 
Uh, so that's way beyond what Tran and I are capable of doing with effects. Uh, luckily, you know, we teach at Noman and we have access <laughs> to some of the best students yeah, in the, the world. Yeah, the students so. are really, really, really talented. Yeah, so, so you can see. Uh, they're going to be joining us in about three weeks to go over this. We want to get this finished. And... Um, will show you but what, one of the things that I was a little bit afraid of is when we started doing some of the effects tests um I was having a hard time let me just see the chats here I was having a hard time um bringing in a bunch of instances from Maya like Unreal did not like that so I could do a, a trillion instances in uh, in Unreal if you have a Niagara thing you could have a trillion little rocks but 2000 instances from Maya it was having a heart attack but uh, we got it to to work from uh, Houdini to um, to Unreal, which is pretty cool. So that's uh, a big thing. We're very happy with that. And this will only just be used in that final shot when the little guy gets killed. The anteater that we're going to call Ricardo the anteater. For our yeah, he Ricardo. does have a name. His name is Ricardo. <laughs> yeah, because Ricardo, every time the anteater comes up, he comments on it. So we're just going to call it anteater Ricardo. So, uh, so that's that. And then the other thing is we have um, our hell hole here. Let me hide this here. So this right here. We wanted to have uh, like more gross stuff coming out of the cracks. So uh, we got this here. This is from Misha, and he'll be joining us as well. This stuff just looks so freaking awesome. So it'll just be like bubbling out of the cracks or whatever. And, you know, they did a few different versions of this. Um, well, M Misha did these. But you can see this one's a little too much. But pretty awesome. Yeah, it's uh, kick-ass. And then uh, we have uh, this one. This can, I, can I ask a question, question about, about this? Go for it. Um, um, is, is, do you guys do this, this in, in Houdini, Houdini or? or uh, this is all Houdini, Maya? yeah. This is all Houdini. Okay, okay. And, and what method, what method did you get, you get into, into Unreal? Unreal? You, you do this, do this with, with VAT, FBXs, or We're going to be bringing it under Lembic, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So it'll be heavy as hell. This is definitely not like real time stuff, but uh, that's that doesn't matter to us. Like we just care that it looks cool in Sequencer. Um, but yeah, so these will be coming out of all the little cracks and stuff, which will be pretty cool. So yeah, so that's uh, th these guys will be joining us. Uh, we just want to get some of the shots done before they they uh, they join us, so they could talk about the whole process of even bringing it into Unreal, which will be pretty cool. We have an echo. Yeah. We have an echo. I guess so. I, I, when I when speak, I hear, I myself, hear myself doubled. 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 Okay, not, so not you, guys. Oh, okay. Do you have speakers on? Or just no, headphones? Head, head, head. Yeah, we're not on the guest mic. I don't I don't hear that. Uh, uh let me can you try it on the other. Yeah, let me try it. Can you speak? Testing. Yeah, yeah you do yeah, have an echo. Yeah. Let me close, close down, down this thing, thing in, in case. case. Maybe it's doubling up. Now I don't hear you at all. Nope. <laughs> I, muted I muted my, my mic, mic for, for a second. second. That gets that rid gets of all, all the audio. audio. Let me check, Let me check my audio. Is your, is your web, uh, webcam recording sound? Uh, no, no. I am I'm sharing, sharing screen. screen. Let, Let me, me stop, stop sharing. sharing. Let's see if that, that corrects anything. anything. No. Still, Still echoing. Echo. Uh -huh. hmm. Yeah, you might want to go to your your settings and see. Um, what what I'm thinking is maybe you have like a uh, enable. Um, what's the Share system audio. 
turned on, and it's like just doubling up what you have there. Testing. Is oh, that's good. Okay, there we go. Cool. In the uh, in this app that we're using, I've just set my audio input. Cool. Okay, cool. So yeah, so uh, we're going to jump into some of the lighting stuff later, but I think DJ, if you just want to take it from here and just uh, give us a little bit about uh, yourself, so you want to press that share screen button again. Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Um, let's, here we go. Let's check it out. Um, so here comes the ultimate fire pack, volume one <laughs> from the, awesome. the Unreal Marketplace. Um, so yeah, let me, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, my background a little bit and then we'll get, dig into what this is, what's coming next, how we made this, why we made this, all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, my name is David Johnson. I go by DJ. Um, I am the CEO and creative director for, uh, a company called Undertone Effects. Uh, and we specialize in visual effects for video games, uh, and, uh, we don't do animation we don't do lighting uh and stuff we just you know in in the game industry visual effects kind of just means like simu you know the the niagara stuff you know these days um the particle systems textures and shaders um so i i've been doing video game uh, effects for a pretty long time now my first job uh was in 98 or so so i've been in this for about 25 years uh, my first game was uh, Tomb Raider Revelations, which I think was the third or fourth one, um, as, a, as a modeler. And then I moved up to Seattle, worked at a few places, including um, uh, Bungie, working on ha the Halo franchise. I worked on Halo 3. Uh, from there, I went over to Activision Blizzard uh, to their Infinity Ward studio, where I worked on Call of Duty for about a decade. I was the head of the effects department for eight of my 10 years there. Uh, and then I broke off and started uh, my own thing. <laughs> so uh, we got a team of, uh, we're about 18 people at this moment, um, spread out all over the world. We've got two guys in New Zealand, uh, some of the East Coast, some of the West Coast. Our clients are, you know, everywhere from, you know, LA to Ireland to Poland. Um, and yeah, we, so, so we're, we're sort of guns for hire for video game effects. So we, we get hired to, to do, you know, the, the weapons, the spells, the destruction, all that stuff. Um, it's mostly for games. It's, it's, it's not so much for the cinematic stuff. It's only, yep. Only games. We, we, okay. we don't even do game cinematics. We just do in-game particles. So our, our it's expertise. Rough real time. Yeah, so we're oh, wow. we're hyper fixated on performance, real time performance, sixty frames a second, sixteen point six milliseconds, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, Lauding our effects so that they're efficient at distance. Which all, all of that knowledge has has gone into this uh, ultimate fire pack. Um, I am also uh, I've been pretty active in the the visual effects society for quite a long time. I served on their board of directors for uh, two years. Uh, I am one of two people in the world with two of those visual effects society awards in the real time category. Uh, Sandy Lynn is the other one. <laughs> is that uh, the one with the, the George Melier, uh Yep. Award? Yeah, oh, the little cool. Man in the Moon award. You know, that's the most. That's my favorite looking award of every award that it, exists. It, it's so cool, and it lights up too. There's, oh, <laughs> the, God, really? the, yeah, there's a little button on the bottom, and it like casts a light up on the moon. It's so cool. I, I love that award. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm I'm published. I've uh, been uh, I've got writing in two different books on effects, uh, and I'm one of the founders of the real time VFX Facebook group, Discord, and website. Wow. Um, so yeah, all of that sort of led me to to doing this this company now, and uh, and I have long favored filmed source for uh, whenever possible, even in video games. Like at my time on the Call of Duty games, you know, like th that explosion uh, that you're seeing there in the distance is is real. It was filmed by the Action VFX guys, and you know, I know a lot of 
a lot of that type of work is now done in, you know, like even for games in Houdini and Embergen. Um, but, you know, I just like just my I taste is that there's these little weird imperfections and timing things to, to, to my eye, film stuff just looks better. Even in, you know, some of the big blockbuster, you know, superhero movies, like I could tell like, yeah, there's that shader. <laughs> so I have long preferred film stuff and used it whenever possible. So um, we, we were a client for the action VFX guys uh, for quite a while. I've, and, and, you know, just occasionally comping out stuff to make textures for it. Um, and I thought, you know, since we're in there doing this anyway, like, wouldn't it be cool if we just, you know, took the work that we're putting into like readying these things for game engine and just, you know, let, let the whole world take advantage of that effort, just start selling them. So, uh, I don't know if they contacted us or we contacted them or what, but um, the idea came up to like just team up and you use our expertise in game engines and real time and video games and just start start prepping some of their best assets for so the video game engines. And here we are. This is the first one we put out. Uh, it's been out about six months now and it's doing pretty well. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of <laughs> it was a lot of effort to to get there and get right. Uh, we prepped it for Unreal Engine and Unity. We did it in both the old systems, Cascade in this case, and Niagara, the new one. Um, we ported it to Unreal Engine five. Um, and yeah, why don't I dig in? Why don't I just show off what this is a little bit? Oh, no. um, so uh, now, before I do, I'll, I'll say uh, the the next thing on the horizon. We spent about a year sort of on and off across, you know, between zero and, and five people at any given moment working on this thing. Um, and we really wanted to just go make it as perfect as possible with tons of exposed parameters and, and efficiency, distance log stuff. And um, it, so it took us so long to do this. We're like, oh, man, if we're going to do a bunch of these and we spend a year on each, <laughs> that's that's too long. So we're we're gonna keep making new packs the next two are intended to be a weapons pack and a weather pack for so you can get you know just buy your snows and rains and you know all film footage top of the line stuff uh but we're we're running at another initiative too to just like a functionally batch convert every single put piece of footage that action vfx has and just not go through all the effort of doing full-on 3D in-game, real-time particle systems with layering and uh, and parameterization. Just kind of like you know minimal viable product, right? Just convert them all and put them on the store so that if if someone just wants all of the textures and is going to kind of build the the particle systems themselves, they just have they can have the entire library. So that's we're about a halfway through converting all those so that's that's sort of the oh, next, wow. one of the next that's things we're coming cool. up with yeah so but this one goes goes deep it it's got a ton of stuff uh in it that makes it you know i think probably the best fire pack you're going to find out there uh for a game engine so let, let me present what what's in this so on the right here are are the full-on particle systems so the idea is that like if you're doing you know a uh a, a a real time, you know, short film or something, you could just buy this pack, open this level. Oops, I hit the wrong button and I have flown <laughs> to the wrong place. Let me get over there again. Uh, hit G to get the controls back. So you could just go into this level, select one of these, you know, can copy it, control C, and then go into your map, whatever you're working on, and you can just paste these around. You know, I'll hit control W and you know, you can just now populate your level with these. Um, and they're set up. Let me let me kind of split screen now so you can see all the controls that we've added to these. So we put a ton of time into like there's, I don't know, 50 something parameters for each one of these. So you can go in and once you've placed it, you can then tune, you know, do you want embers or not okay let's just turn the embers off on this one instance the intermittent ones that kind of spark and burst every once in a while 
let's turn those off so that and then let's see let's turn the size down I think that's way at the top so that's at the two let's make this guy a little bit smaller so every single one that you place will won't feel so rubber stamped um you know each one will you can kind of tune and customize a little bit of difference in it uh there's one for which texture it got used so these two sitting next to each other now uh, are gonna have a different texture in it so they don't see you don't know, see that same like little pattern somewhere um so just you know distortion light uh the embers how big it is how bright it is how much wind it takes uh the playback speed of it like just tons and tons of stuff in here is customizable um and so let's let's open one of these i just took like fire medium right here so under particles fire niagara fire medium. here we go so we're going to open up this niagara effect let me bring it over to this window oh by the way i've got this video hovering here this is one of the uh this is just a procedure for our team one of the asks is whenever we start a task um we go make a reference montage we just go find footage of the thing you're working on and and i asked the team to just leave it hovering you know often on another monitor but you know just just to kind of reinforce the point that this is useful never lose sight of it yeah you're always comparing your work to the real thing so like it just just having that like the whole time i'm working on these i'm looking at the real stuff and i'm like does something feel weird comparing real film stuff right is the speed wrong the scale so we ask all of our artists to do that and and part of it is just a, a way to improve the quality of our things and so i'm going to leave that up here looping this whole podcast <laughs> to reinforce that like and look over it from time to time look at what we've done and compare it to what they and like see if if there's something like oftentimes we'll just find something in like okay that little black smoke up there maybe we should add a little more contrast where we've got some white smoke and some dark smoke there's little things that you'll just pick out and you're like that would be good let me add that to the thing i've worked on that's pretty so, good for me yeah yeah <laughs> and that's just part of our like default process so here is uh the smoke i'll step you through the layers so uh there is a light in here which if i solo it you will see nothing because there's no ground it's actually just kind of a skybox there's nothing actually underneath it for the sky light to illuminate um there is a distortion layer if i solo that it gets pretty subtle to see but i, I here on my monitor it's slightly yeah, warping yeah. that building yeah, there I like to see it too um and then we've got two different the primary fire layer there it is it's a particle uh, it does a thing so it disappears if you look straight down on it that way you know if if you put this in a, in a world in a game and you walk over and look straight down on it it's weird to see like that edge on fire so we make it fade off and then one of the other layers over here takes on that top down look um we added uh, a second one which is it picks a different texture from the first one it's slightly smaller and it's pushed towards the camera slightly and that that happens no matter what angle you're turning around from part of that is for vr we, we intend for these to be usable in vr whenever you have a single still big card in vr just the stereoscopic you know vision like it looks pretty dumb it's like all right there's the thing the illusion is fine in not stereoscopic vision but like it, it just so shows off so one trick that i've found is is like it's pretty you can give a little bit more like depth feel if these two things are kind of interrupting each other at a slight distance offset so it, it looks good and fine in in sort of standard viewing but makes it so it doesn't look like garbage in vr so yay there's a win um then fire top this is this only shows up when you're looking straight down on it oh that's uh, take, pretty cool takes over that angle so you still like get fiery stuff no matter what transition yeah pretty, that's what i was thinking the transition amazing, is nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's shader tricks so so they're all spawning all the time 
but we've we've sort of built into a little slight crossfade so that when the, the angle of the camera to the thing, blah, 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 math stuff, yay, <laughs> crossfades. Uh, and then there's, so so this one is just sort of like a, a still of like looking at fire from above. And then this other one is some like 3D particles that kind of fill it in a little more. And the two of these together, you know, do a fine job of like, you know, feeling like a 3D-ish thing from above. As I'm running this and kind of looping it, you, you'll see little dropout stuff that shouldn't be happening uh, normally. Uh, we actually just submitted a fix for some of that. All right, and then we've got smoke. We've got two kinds of smoke in here. Um, this one is a single card that is just like like the other one, camera facing. We didn't bother to Fresnel it out because if you look at it from above, the other particle smoke kind of takes over. Right. So even if they're both there, it, you don't notice it too much. Um, yeah, there you go. And then the embers. So we, we authored these ambient ones first, and these are just intended to be, um, so they have like some curl noise on them. Um, and they're, they're just kind of always spawning and you can, you can, for every instance that you place, you can turn that up or down. Do you want just a teeny bit, a, a little, you know, occasional, uh, or a whole, you know, a whole ton of them. Uh, you can tune that all without, and, and, and part of the point too is a lot of these little controls are exposed in a, the, a blueprint. So you don't need to know Niagara at all to just take these, copy and paste it and crank up the ember count. It's just an exposed parameter right there. So you don't need to be a games effects artist to, to take advantage of all this stuff. Um, this next emitter is uh, an intermittent one that kind of turns itself on and off. It kind of goes on a pulse. And the purpose of that was whenever you got a high count thing, it, it feels a little artificial when it's just like kind of even forever, right? So this was intended to be kind of a, a, an interruption element. So it's almost like the log breaks and then the little. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you're sitting there at the campfire and you hear, bah! you know, a, a, an ember pops and poof, you get a bunch of uh, extras. Well, it's, actually this third one is is really that there's a burst where you get a whole bunch of them but this these two together kind of pulse you between like you know one amount and another amount both of which you can tune right and then this third one is just an occasional Pops. once in a while like bleh, here's a whole cough of more curl noise stuff so all three of those together You get a little, little more, and then a burp of them. Yeah, it looks really nice. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, by the way, you'll see this effect in Niagara in this preview. It, it's it's resetting every once in a while, and that has to do with how Niagara kind of timelines. When it's placed in the environment, it doesn't do that. It's just it just kind of goes forever. Um, so there is a, a look at, you know, the, one of them and, and then this paired blueprint just, just does a bunch of stuff. Oh, let me, uh, un... let me ask you a quick question. When, sure. When yeah. You shoot. Say that you are able to change the, the texture so that the, there's variation between the two of them. Is yeah. it just offsetting, um, the image sequence, or is it actually using a different sequence of images? Yeah, good question. It, it's using a totally different set of, it's a totally different texture. So okay. so I'll, 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 let me explain this too. That's actually a good question. So we've authored this thing in in five sizes. Tiny, and you can see the little, tiny, little labels, tiny, small, medium large and then there's this big old hero like yeah yeah like black hawk down you know oil tanker explosion you know. so 
for each of these, we prepped four different textures. So there are four different totally independent like texture sequences. So this is a 64 frame flipbook texture. This is a different 64 frame. So, and, and the purpose of that was like when you see the exact same one over and over and over again, like, hey, you know, there, there it is. It feels like, you know, tileable texture problem. You kind of just, it breaks the illusion. So there's four different mediums, four different smalls. And then, you know, these large ones down here are totally independent. Now, sometimes like medium, you'll kind of see this similar little like elbow right here, this little negative space on the right of someone. Some of these came from the same clip, just different points in time, so that like they they feel pretty similar, but they're but they're not like identical. There's just enough variance in there that yeah, it kind of breaks it up. So so with these, you can tell it to you know so so what I've selected here is a blueprint that contains that Niagara effect. And the blueprint has all these exposed parameters that are driving the Niagara stuff. So this little section where it says variation, we probably kind of should have called that texture variation to be more clear. You can tell it to you just randomly pick yourself, Mr. Particle System, or you can explicitly set it. So like if you're if for you guys, I would probably explicitly set it right. You've got a row of torches, and you yeah. probably you don't want to see two like right next to each other that are the identical one and and they also inherently pick random start frame right so even if you have two next to each other hopefully they're like in different parts of the cycle and you won't notice it too much but for you guys if you have like a whole row of tiki torches which you do you could go you know you can explicitly set them one two three four one two three four with the different phase offset built in. And so hopefully you won't, they, they'll feel like they're all different ones. But I, I think one thing that that we were hoping people would do and they, they kind of miss is they sh people should be, when they're placing them, just go and fiddle with some numbers, right? These four are the exact same Niagara effect, but they look quite different. They have, you know, some of them are remembering, some of them are not. This one's tiny, this one's big. So our hope was that, you know, you'd go place them Make them one, two, three, four, but then also like make one a little bit bigger for you know oh you know they, somebody poured more whatever wrapped it with more cloth so it's got a bit of a bigger fire. What would be awesome is if there was like a global um, randomizer, like it just went in. Uh, programs like World Machine, for example, have that. And it's literally the icon of a dice. So you have all your nodes, and you press that button. There's no one doing because it's changing the attributes. <laughs> stuff, but you press it. And boom, it changes all the attributes and randomizes them. For lazy people like me. For lazy people. <laughs> well, well, the good news is that it, it is inherently doing that with its default parameters, right? Like it, it's it, well, for variation. Well, let's see. I think use random is is or is not checked by default. I forget. I think it might be default. I think it is. Yeah. But I did. Uh, I, um, I did it's not randomness. actually. <laughs> so you could just check this and then every time you run the thing it'll just give you a different random one um so yeah so so that is largely what it is so so this may not be clear but the intent is to show like over here these niagara systems these are the full-blown deep niagara tons of exposed parameter systems showing what it looks like when you take we place a few of them and do some of that tuning and tune things turn things on and off and 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 do some of that like customizing uh like, like would, do, would you want to show like can you show like an example like just grabbing duplicating two fires and just making them completely different yeah sure so so like these two are the exact same particle system with just some things tuned right this one has less smoke so let's do that so let's take the fire medium blueprint let's get rid of this one which i copied so here it will be with just its default parameters. So let's take two of them, control W, and let's get them to not look like each other. Uh, so let's go, uh, let, I just got a, a bug that <laughs> in Unreal 5 anyway, this light, some of the light settings aren't doing anything. Let's see if they work right now. Okay, that's brighter. No, okay. It looks like it's broken in this one too. 
graphics. Um, let's turn, so let's just turn off a couple things. We'll make the right one a little more minor uh, and the left one a little more dominant. So let's start with smoke density. What happens when we set it to zero? Okay, you don't see any smoke at all. All right, so let's bring it back a little bit, a little, yeah, hint of it. There we go. And then let's crank the density of this one up a little more. All right, so now that one's much thicker smoke. Uh, let's make this one a little bit bigger. This one a little bit smaller. Uh, this one a little less bright. This one a little more bright. Let's crank the turbulence on this. Let's give it like a bunch more embers. So, and and a lot of the like, one, one little philosophy in this, you'll see a lot of these numbers are one. Uh, we sort of left a lot of things as a normalized value. We're like a default good looking fire with the amount of smoke and amount of embers that we thought was about realistic is, is our one. And then you can kind of just crank it up or down from there. Put it to zero and you'll have none of it. Put it to three and you'll have a bunch more of, of any given thing. So these embers spawn rate, all right, let's just go. Okay, we capped it at two, so you don't get too much of it. Uh, let's let's just let's just crank a bunch of ember stuff. Yeah. Okay, burst interval. That's how frequently you want that burst to happen. So let's take it. And there's a min max, not zero. That's too low. Let's. Okay, so now it'll burst more frequently. Rise rate, turbulence, oh, quantity. I, well, oh, we shouldn't have capped it at two. We want you to be able to have like an obscene amount if you want. But let's turn these ones down. Let's get rid of the bursts on that one and then just go spawn rate 0.2, quantity 0.2. So there we go. There's just real quick, you know, pretty diverged looks now from the same exact effect. Yeah, it's very versatile. You can really do a lot, which is really nice. Yeah. And I think I just found a bug or <laughs> two that I should probably <laughs> fix and patch. We just submitted a patch this morning for uh, for you guys for a, a dropped frame thing we were we were noticing. Um, there, there's special logic in here, too, in the materials and shaders so that uh, if it clips the ground, it kind of sucks when it, like you just see the hard line. So there's a little bit of scrolling noise in there to make a, a, a geo intersection a little softer. Uh, usually you're gonna have fire on some kind of uneven terrain. So in sort of our test case, it, it works pretty well. Um, you're not generally gonna have fire on a perfectly flat thing, but um, yeah, there you go. There's an example of all the tuning you can do. I think I think that is an underutilized thing. We, 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 in the videos we've seen of people using the stuff, they tend to just like populate them and then that's it. Just and <laughs> and <laughs> and that's the least effort way to go. And so that's kind of why we have these four different sizes in mind, so that you could do that, right? If you just need to get in real quick and like blah blah blah. All right, block out some fires. Yay, they're there. You know, you can kind of have a range to work with, but if you really want to, you know, go farther, you can you can do that. Um, so so that's what uh, these are across on the where on the Niagara Systems wall. Um, over here is just showing off all of the textures in isolation. Uh, the intent is that you won't use these or copy and paste them, although you could. Um, but those are just showing like if you can. Kind of like I stepped through and muted and soloed each layer one at a time. Those are all the textures that go into it. So the embers all come from these three. Uh, this explosiony thing is what is the sort of source of this hero fire over here. Uh, there's a thick smoke, and then it fades to this like nice wispy smoke up here it's for its final. Nice. We just, yeah, I love it. Yeah. We like that one a lot, but we can't use it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really good. It's so. It's, it's not cheap too. This is 
uh yeah it's pretty expensive but yeah we put a lot of love into this hero fire i wanted this to be kind of you know the the best one there is out there uh, <laughs> uh and, and presentation like this it, it feels like you're in a museum of chaos right like uh, yeah <laughs> totally um so yeah so those are the these are all you know the uh the only thing that is not from the action VFX library here, I believe, are these two smokes. I think un undertone effects, we kind of simmed these internally to in I think our man Mike did these. Uh, oh, by the way, Neil, who's in the in the in the chat here, was one of the heavy lifters uh, on this. He did a lot of the work, uh, Krupa there. Krups. Um, uh, uh, the the fellow who did the heavy lifting on the compositing, which I can show off too, for how did we get it into the engine from the action VFX footage, which I've got right. Where's my yes. VFX file? Um, uh, his name's Faraji, which is a Swahili name, by the way. Uh, <laughs> nice for your guys' project. Um, yeah, let me let me. Do we have time for me to show this off? The, the like, how yes, do you? Totally. We like how to do you? It. Yeah, we'll prep it for game engine. So uh, I'm going to do the abridged version <clears throat> to make this uh, kind of quick. But starting with the the Action VFX website. So so if you're not familiar with it, this is the website for the Action VFX guys. They are our good buddies. Um, I love this company and I love what they do. I'm oh, a man. huge fan of, of this. They are just killing it, right? <laughs> We're subscribers. Uh, we, we love them. So yeah, I, they've I, got a new subscription model too. They, yeah. They're also uh, moving to uh, a, a new releases every month kind of like feature of their subscription, which is killer. Yeah, I love um, that. Which we're gonna have to keep up with, right? Because if we're gonna if we're prepping every texture in the library for the thing, we're gonna have to be cranking out new ones every month. So our our hope is that they're we're gonna sell one like just Uber. I don't know. We haven't come up with the name for it yet, but like all the effects textures in the world pack <laughs> which will probably be you know kind of studio level you know expensive but then it'll like the subscription i think the intent is to like as as they produce new stuff sort of for compositing and film and tv we will then be feeding it into this pack so you know you buy it once and then you'll get all the updates over time which i think is going to be pretty cool so we we started so we knew when we did this we wanted like that tiny small medium and large so we went to their website they've got you know the fire section and then we, we just looked for ones in here that are oh there you go ground fire volume two um ones that are gonna sit on the ground we, we intend to do a future pack that is like building on fire ceiling on fire doors stuff um but this is this is what we wanted to do for our first one um and then as these load in so we just looked for ones that are that that kind of like you know these need to be a square in the game engine in the end well they could be a two to one but ones that kind of stayed put that have enough interesting stuff but aren't too unique like if they're leaning too far then that that's gonna look too like they, they need to be a little kind of like even in a way kind yeah. of straight up kind of balanced in terms of weighting left to right so we just, I don't know which one we ended up using specifically. It's kind of a combination of them. Uh, but so anyway, we picked the one that we thought, like, okay, this is going to be good for the large one. And I think a different pack had the what we ended up using for the small ones. But so we downloaded the whole thing, and then this is this is what it looks like. So we we were taking you know ground fire eleven, the piece of footage there it is which is a uh 20 second clip and then yeah let me bring up ground fire 11 and then out the other edge of end of it we export this texture let it load so that is all the prep work of of looping it framing it sizing it making it power of two pixel you know uh power of two aspect ratio having it fade back into itself, which is kind of the real, the real tricky part. Uh, this is playing absolutely. back at two times its rate. So so here's our little internal process. Uh, I sort of established it, and then uh, Faraji did a lot of the heavy lifting to just bring a lot of them over. But we, we kind of use After Effects. I know a lot of people use Nuke. I, I just, my, my history is in After Effects, so we did it here. 
Um, I kind of like in Nuke, you would like sort of connect nodes, right? I sort of use a series of nested comps for like an operation. So it begins with just bringing the footage and each, each comp has uh, a name that kind of implies what it's doing. Uh, it gets centered, we crop it, we run a little color correction on it, levels. We do some edge suppression on it to like make sure the, the faint alpha stuff doesn't hit the edge. We time crop it. So instead of 20 seconds of that, now it's a, a good, not necessarily six, uh, 64 frames, but like it, it has to, in the end, be 64 frames, right? Just the way video game engines work and texture memory, you have to have power of two and it's easiest if you make them divisible by two. So all of these, we just prepped at eight by eight. Um, so then we need a little more time. So 64 frames is roughly two seconds. So we need more time than that so that we can have, uh, you know, a, a head and a tail to kind of like, you know, have it loop back into itself. Right. Uh, so then we have this transition mask thing. Um, we, we did, we changed how we handled the, the wipe, uh, over time. I, this was probably one of the early ones. I think we we did the wipe in a different way in the end. But here, that gets color corrected. It's essentially a, a noise that is phase inverting multiplied against a gradient that is raising up. So now you've got this kind of like sharp edge that that roughly mirrors the like up flowing rate of the fire. And then that's used as sort of a crossfade thing. So there it is. There's a little like line luminance dip you can see. Uh, and I think we did some stuff to sort of correct that out. Yeah, we, we kind of made a mat out of that dip and then used that to sort of boost it back to match. There's That's the like that little compensation thing. Uh, then we split it into separate like alpha. Here is that luminance problem corrected in the alpha. It's funny you're still you're still you're doing this in After Effects, but you are kind of treating it like Nuke anyway. You are doing like a... yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, and there it is. Looks looks pretty pretty decent. You don't really see the the like loop point. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then we've got pretty... the RGB straight. We recombine them. Uh, resize it to be, you know, power two, and then we send it out to the the output file. So uh, from there, there's a, a, a silly little program called Glue It. So we just output like P, I think it's either PNG or TGA frames, and then where's my little Glue It program? Right over here. So this file, this thing, you can like. Uh, load, or no, you add, you add files. I'm showing, I'm showing you the, the real stuff over here. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, anyway, you, you, you select all the, the, the frames that you just output and it turns it into a big Atlas, a texture sheet. Uh, and then that is what you import into unreal. And I'll show you one of the textures on this side of the equation. So we've got mar materials, particles, textures. So here is fire, large. Um, we run it through another program called Slate to give you optical flow on it so that it frame blends. This is one, uh, I'll, I'll show that off real quick. Um, if you slow down time, you know, some games will have like bullet cam where, where you shoot someone and then it like, you see it in slow-mo. Things like this, flipbooks playing back like at a, at a frame rate that's too slow, it's kind of a bummer. So, but it's expensive to include optical flow. So we, we did this with both options. You can, ba it's, you can just swap all of these over to either the standard or optical flow material. If you don't have time dilation, use the standard one it's faster if you do have time dilation put it over the the other one but here is uh that texture now in unreal engine 
uh, and you can see it. There it is. Uh, we call, straight is is the type of um, the type of output that you want to do because when that is you know when you this is before it's pre multiplied. Right, exactly. Uh, you'll see, man. I I can't tell you how many times I see people get that wrong. Like, it, like people will that you know you'll often have you see this and like that looks all weird. What's all this stupid noise over here? That's that looks incorrect. So you'll see just the straight up like RGB where where it's going to black. But then when you alpha against that, you're you're dropping luminance towards the end, and everything has this little black. Ghosting. Like I see that so often in video games, people get that wrong so often. But this is the <laughs> if if you see this weird noise on the edge, and and some strange sparkly colorful things, it is correct. So this is this is this is doing it the right way. There it is. So it should be getting kind of a deep saturated red towards the very fade off stuff, not uh, kind of blackened. And so that's how you get this. I mean, this is a nice look to the spire. The coloring's coloring's good. Um, so yeah, there's lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, is this a, a good time to look at questions or do you guys have questions for me? Well, yeah, let's see if anybody does have questions. Uh, sometimes like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't have a lot of questions. Sometimes we'll have a million questions. So let's see if anybody has a question. We have a question that's unrelated to it's just a general question like what's the first step to start a career in gaming in visual effects uh these type of questions are very broad but uh yeah i guess the the first step is just to really want to do this and realize that it's a lot of work and then just building your portfolio uh i think so then the question that his follow-up was so does certification matter uh it doesn't really matter. The difference, though, is you have a lot of competition. And if you do go to a good school, your work is just going to be better. That's just really what it comes down to. But uh, if you're good, you're good. Um, yeah. Certification doesn't matter. This is one of the few industries where the proof is in the pudding. You could just see it in the portfolio. You know, it's not like heart surgery where they're taking a risk on you unless you have a certification. Like, here's my portfolio. I'm sure, DJ, you talk to somebody that's applying for the job. You could almost tell if they're good without even looking at their portfolio just by hearing them talk. You'll know, <laughs> right? You'll know just by the, the the type of questions or answers that they give you. Like, oh, this guy knows his stuff. Um, the certification is not. Um, yeah, I mean, no, certification is not that important. Um, maybe if you work at a prestigious company, that uh, helps you also. But um, if you're talking about just getting in, then your portfolio is pretty much everything. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. You look at some of the students that went to Noman and you look at where they were the first term and then like a year and a half later, two years, whatever the length is. And the, the growth in that amount of time is like astonishing sometimes. It's yeah. It's crazy. Like you're like, how is this the same person? So I don't know if you would have, if they would have grown like that without it. And I'm not just trying to sell it because we work for Noman, but it, it is just the truth. And, you know, it's in, it's in look at who, who always wins the rookies and stuff like the work that the, the Noman students do is phenomenal. Um, can, can I rant on, on that one too? Yeah, go for mm -hmm. it. Um, and I'll address another question in there. Uh, Andreas glad as says, what's up, DJ? What's up, Andreas? <laughs> He's uh, he, Andreas is one of the best uh, of games effects artists in the industry. He is nice. yeah well known to be one of the top people in the world at this. So hi, Andreas. What's up, man? Um, but yeah, you, so so uh, asking about getting in a, a career in the game industry as a three D artist, um, uh, apart from a portfolio. Um, what one thing to mention too is is you know what discipline are you do you want to go into i, I mean I, I will i will speak more specifically to like trying to become an effects artist in games as opposed to um you know a character modeler environment modeler hard hard prop modeling and vehicles and weapons um uh so you know you have to you have to pick a sub discipline too and i think one thing that is really challenging in games effects is you know, a lot of times 
like no Noman is an effects school, right? So you if you went to Noman, you you probably you know know a little more and and got into the discipline you want. A lot of the game programs around the country, you know, SCAD here has a really killer games program. You know, there's Full Sail, there's Digipen, there, and a lot, a lot of universities now have have game programs. Uh, Utah State, um, you know, when when like when when people sign up for a a games program they're coming into it like yay i I like to do art and draw and i like video games they don't really know that that games effects is even a job title that exists right that that is not there's so few of us and and you know you you see the characters you see like the, the environments and props so a lot of a lot of games art students come into it thinking they're gonna do either animation or make characters or or be like a modeler right um so that's been a challenge for us to just sort of even let people know that like a games effects artist is a thing that you can specialize in and next to no schools in the world i think noman is one of the few exceptions i think utah i believe utah state now has a, a class that is specific to doing video game effects right whether you're learning niagara um so but th- that was a bit of a tangent i i guess i would say you know your your portfolio is sort of is your entry point right and and what i as a hiring manager am looking for is what is your artistry you know it, it's it's sort of assumed that anyone who has gone through a class has like fired up unreal engine and probably you know made a particle system exist in niagara that's kind of like the bare bones minimum they've done some effect so but what we want to see when i get excited i'm like yes i need to hire this person it always comes down to like the timing was really good in their effect or how like i couldn't see where one layer ends and the next begin the coloring is good the shape language is good it has a good like rhythm and pulse instead of like you know thing cast bang instead of it being very linear it'll have a like it'll have like little holds and timing and if i can like if i can do sound effects instead with my voice to your effect like yes that like that's good stuff we want that those little staccato weird timing things in there i like how you Um, describe that because it (laughs) it actually makes total sense you know you're using sound you're like yeah i see what you mean oh we 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 always communicate to each other with with like <laughs> like verbal sound effects of like what we're trying to make and it it's it's great like i you know music stuff back there right? i have a bit of a music background so like i i think a lot in times of like the the cadence and 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 the beat of of an effect and all that so um so yeah work on that I, I, another suggestion i would give is yeah take take classes at at nomen uh, Utah State has a program too. <laughs> yeah, Andre is nice. Um, and get into the community. We have a great, you know, real time VFX has a Facebook group. More importantly, a Discord channel where you could just ask questions and people are. I, I was just in, uh, you know, Andreas is always answer, <laughs> answering my question. Thank you, Andreas, for that. But, you know, I was having trouble with this bug literally for your your guys' project right now. You guys bought this and there was a frame drop in rendering. And I was in the Discord asking, you know, like, hey, who knows about how to loop a thing and the infinite particle? And, you know, Wyeth, the guy at Epic, who's one of the architects of Niagara, is in there like, hey, did you try this checkbox and this combination of settings? That's so awesome. get in there. The, the website, <laughs> realtimevfx.com has monthly competitions do them if you're trying to get into this even if your stuff sucks just just get in there i will guarantee pretty much everybody who wins one of those competitions is immediately hired somewhere because in order to win it you just show that you've got better timing color shape language all all that stuff so so get in there just as practice to just like flex you there you go real time vx.com just just to flex your you know your muscles and 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 get exercise in this language of game effects and then yeah if you win these you are you are seen by experts doing it by hiring managers you will get hired so just keep doing that until you win 
and then you got a job. <laughs> There's my suggestion. I like it. That is a great suggestion. Um, just the other day, I had a student ask me, uh, so I, I want to do effects or I want to do um, environment modeling in games. I'm like, what should I do? I'm like, you should probably do effects. Because <laughs> there's a lot of um, a lot of modelers, right? So. Yeah. So here's the double-edged sword with that in my mind. There is a, you know, this is part of why my company is doing so well and so busy right now is there is a massive deficit in games effects artists because there's not many people that do it. It takes a little bit of like, it takes a lot of artistry to, to be good at it, but it takes a, a, a bit of a technical mind too, which, you know, a lot of people like going into art school may not, may be intimidated by, you know, scripting and math and all that stuff, which there is some of in, although I dropped out of, I think pre-algebra, I never passed. So I was bad at math in school. So you, <laughs> you can get by with this and not be a math head, but um there the inverse of that is there is a ton of environment work to do on every game environment departments at a game company is going to be the largest of the art departments you know 20 30 people is is not uncommon you know your effects departments they're getting bigger now but for the longest time it was you know two people <laughs> now like a bit a, a good big our uh, effects department is you know like oh my goodness we have 10 effects artists like all right um so so it's kind of there's a lot more competition on the environment side because it, it's sort of easier to get into there's a ton of positions doing that um but then you're competing against a lot more people because there's a larger pool whereas in effects it's it's harder to do it takes more like effort to get to a like hireable state uh, but salaries are inflated. You're going to probably make more as an effects artist than you will as an environment artist. Um, and I'll say, like, it is so fun and challenging just in that, like, you know, if not to, you know, speak ill of <laughs> other disciplines, but if you're modeling, you know, props for environments or, or whatever, you're kind of doing this, a similar thing, you know, like, you've got concept art and and you're you're making meshes and texturing them you know hopefully you'll get better at it and be able, you know your sculpting it will improve over time but what you're doing is not fundamentally changing over time effects is like there's just so much i don't know right that i like i'll lean on our other guys to do because like it's changing all the time like you know fluid sims and and you know houdini and now ember gen is here and and fluid ninja and and like particles and sims and rigging and and color and time like there's just like you are constantly like pushing yourself in games effects so that that's that makes it a pretty pretty rewarding position to be in yeah sure uh yeah miguel asked internally if i have a company real it is uh we do yeah our, our website is undertoneeffects.com uh our reel is fairly out of date at this point <laughs> we should do a new edit uh yeah you can find it on uh, undertoneeffects.com you should click home and then go to gallery uh there's can a whole bunch it? of stuff that'd be cool you, uh, uh, i don't know how well sure am i am i sharing screen still yeah yeah here is so this is largely my own personal reel uh, from when the company started uh but uh, i'll just give you all the the short version here's the two minute not the 12 minute one if you have a 12 minute reel you've been doing this for a long time yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i have uh there is audio in here i don't yeah turn it up do you guys hear that no no It's a lot of Call, Call of Duty stuff uh, in here. This scene, I did a, a talk at Nomen about uh, many years ago.
that's cool. Some of it is playing choppy, but you get the 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 gist of it. It's really. Some of these look just gigantic. Some of those explosions and the debris, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. a lot of stuff. Part of the fun to me is is doing stuff like that, where it's like you really there's a lot of little effects in games, all these you know spells and weapon stuff, but doing like big crazy things that have never been seen in a game before. You know, buildings coming down, planes crashing into buildings, taking them down. Like, that's the stuff that's like, it's hard. It takes a lot of time. You you frustrate yourself with it, but then that's where sort of the, the payoff is. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, there we go. There's our company reel. We've done a lot more like stylized stuff since then, and uh, yeah, we gotta <laughs> we gotta do a new edit soon. I mean, to me, the effect stuff seems really awesome. Um, when I started 3D, I didn't even think that that was a thing. So like you saying all that stuff, I could relate to it. I think most people starting out don't know a lot about 3D and the, the different departments. And the thing that they relate to the most is just like a visual thing. So like, oh, how to make a, you know, a car or how to make a character. And so that a lot of people tend to just go in that direction. And that's what I did. But I think it was, you know, you made very good points about that. Um, I probably would have done something different if I knew a little bit more. But I'm, I'm cool with the route I went. Itran always uh, <laughs> wishes she had done Houdini instead. <laughs> I do. I just, I kind of, went, uh, I think I would have liked to have been an effects artist. But I didn't do that. And I specialized in characters. So. Well, um, characters are uh, awesome too. But characters yeah. and effects, I think, you know, you, you kind of get... You get your work shown in the trailers, and you know there's there's an excitement to that. <laughs> sure, but there's uh, I think effects are awesome. <laughs> Me too. So, well, for sure, I bet you think so. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I usually tell students like that's good career choice. There's more security. Um, there's not a lot of people doing it, and it is exciting and really cool. And you're going to get trained in the in, this, in Nomen, so you might as well take advantage of it. Yeah, it can also be, I, I think I totally agree 100% with everything you just said. It can also be painful. Like it is, <laughs> oh, you know, hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of the performance issues that happens in games, you know, whether or not the effects department is the cause of it or not, usually we get we get told to address it and deal with it, like turn turn your stuff down. So one thing a lot of us become really obsessive with is 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 like, profiling and the statistics of it the numbers i could show you like here's a, a, a little slide uh, i've got from a talk i did uh at nomen uh, a million years ago from modern warfare 3 th this shows you know just sort of the f i mean we all kind of know in our head video games are real time and 30th or 60th a second but like here's a little illustration of what that means so like in every second of, of gameplay, right? If it's a 60 FPS game, that's how much of the second you have to to draw the whole frame, update all the animations, update the, the game state, do the effects. So within that one frame, you have, there's 16.6 thousandths of a second is, is the duration of that. That's how much time you have to draw everything. And, you know, you need it, you know, if so, of 16.6 milliseconds that is one thousandth of a second and usually your environment team's going to get about seven of those and your effects team is allowed three thousandths of a second <laughs> to do <laughs> I, all of the stuff to to do the updates the simulations to draw it well thankfully the simulation is done on the cpu often and the, the drawing of it is on the gpu so now you've got two different parallel loads but like yeah you, and you, and we become obsessed with like making sure and and profiling and looking at our particle we get obsessive about our particle accounts just to make sure we stick within these budgets um you know you kind of learn early on the funny thing is 
when I was at Infinity Ward, uh, Andreas was at Dice, so they were doing Battlefield, and and we're doing Call of Duty, right? Which are like you know like I don't know competing properties, but we're we're like buddies and talking to like we're you know we're it's funny that some of the like you know competitive stuff like it really doesn't apply to the people making the games. We we all know each other and like each other, and um, but yeah you become obsessed with with this too and so one one way you you, you check it is like when you do mess up and everyone does uh, except for on <laughs> except for andreas <laughs> you you profile it so you do a a this is this is a program called pix uh there's one for playstation called ps razor and it basically you can kind of like step through your scene and you can look at we're basically looking for nanosecond which is to say billionth of a second timings that it, how long did it take to draw this one smoke texture it took 0.7 milliseconds now keep in mind your entire budget is you know three so if i had one single smoke just took almost one of my three bars like that's a problem i gotta turn it down so that, that's how i learned that like that is the effect that it was too expensive and i need to turn it down so 0.3 milliseconds point so so 700,000 nanoseconds billionths of a second translates to 0.7 milliseconds and that that is the scale so we are literally doing billionth of a second timings on all of our work to make sure we didn't mess it up sounds really rough um we got yeah. our like film background so we don't care about, we don't care about that at we all we don't care i mean yeah. it's obviously really important yeah. and i think actually um the average person that's not um working in any kind of this field understands a little bit because a lot of people play video games um yeah, yeah with your chatter about the frame rate and things like that so um i think it's relatable and it's just funny how we're both using unreal but we're like in completely different worlds in a way like like you guys have to worry about so much stuff that is it's amazing like the amount of things you have to think about <laughs> like when you were mentioning like the the vr goggles like we'd never even thought about that like oh crap the fire would look flat wouldn't it if you, if you look at it in 3d uh you know how it blends between angles and all that stuff yeah and yeah we're totally stuff for like a six gigabyte alembic file that's fine let's just throw it in there like yeah and we're yeah. only worried about what looks good in that Sequen shot sequence, um, yeah. in that particular shot and anything outside of that doesn't matter. Whereas the game, you got to walk around. The player has to explore everything. And yeah. there's so many different things. So yeah, exactly. And if something takes 10 minutes to render one frame because that's still way better than what we were. <laughs> yeah. Like we have an hour. 3000. <laughs> That's yeah, how we, we get. <laughs> yeah, we had 24 hour frames on our previous project. Yeah. So, and we, just for us, like when we were working, trying to ren render like, um, BDBs, like clouds and stuff like that, uh, that was, <laughs> it would take like four hours to render a cloud. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so what do so you impressive. think is is the future like with with like the vdbs being uh like plugins for unreal so you can bring vdbs what do you think is the future of niagara and effects for 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 this real-time stuff and and what do you think is going to happen now that there is kind of like two different disciplines inside of unreal and unity right like you have unity doing that crazy lion demo with that insane groom that weta did and then yeah. you have uh, the game stuff. So, what do you think is going to happen? Follow that. Um, you know, and and to, to just you know riff on that too. Like the 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 PS Five is kind of a game changer in its architecture as well. Where and and Unreal Five is is sort of pairing with you know you know a, a lot of times. So because we're so constrained by real time right a 60th of a second is what i've been doing for the last 15 years right yeah modern warfare one had to draw in a 60th of a second on a and an xbox was it a 360 or is that when we had moved up to yeah xbox 360. so your your cpus get more powerful every year your gpus so like how many particles you can 
process and draw each generation gets a little you know get gets faster what what you can accomplish in those 16.6 milliseconds advances um but ps5 kind of went in a different direction it does have a faster cpu and gpu than the ps4 but its big advancement was hard drive speed what happens when hard drive speeds go through the roof with new like m.2 nvme storage where you're getting you know 7.5 7500 you know um rewrite from the disk like that's not something we've ever thought about like who cares it's like you know you sit there and wait for all of the data to go from the disk to memory when the level loads and then some things you can do fancy like you know you walk through part of the level so it can get unloaded and now you're walking to the next part but and, and that that j world just changed with with ps5 and ue5 where the their whole is it called nanite tech where you could just have like billion polygon scenes and the entire level just goes to micro polygons and like that you can kind of have the hard drive function as ram in in a way like this is a whole like new world of possibility and it's changing things in ways that like a little more cpu and gpu you know whatever at this point we've already got really nice shaders and high triangle counts so this is like this is kind of a whole this is a game changer so i think that is you know the biggest deal now looking forward into the future like where is this going to go um man i i think i think there was there was a tech that was hinted at that that my suspicion is going to be a big deal who knows how many years out and and that is to say um distributed like distributed processing and rendering so and and follow me here so consider that a game console you know th this limit that we have that we have had forever 16.6 milliseconds like although machines are gonna continue to get more powerful and you can do more stuff in it we're always just constrained we don't we're you guys are spending 10 minutes on a render, right? What would happen if we were no longer constrained by 16.6? Say you're coming to a part of the game and you want a bonkers scene to occur in a, in a few seconds. What if you could just say, okay, Cloud, give me 70 more Xboxes for the next five seconds. <laughs> and like you could have, you know, you could basically turn the cloud into a, a, a very temporary yeah. render farm and like the results get sent back to you I, I think like it's been handed that we like even quite a long time ago now crackdown 3 had tech in it in their multiplayer that was that did some distributed processing and sending the results back stadia and and other attempts on live to to do like you know everything is rendered remotely by beefy computers that get upgraded and really just a video signal is sent there's latency problems with that but i think i think that that no one saw this fast hard drive being a game changer coming and it's here and it's like oh man ratchet and clank really took advantage of it to amazing effect i super love that game and that's on on ps5 yep that's on ps5 and i i i suspect that this like distributed stuff is going to be sort of the next like game changer. I don't know how far. I don't think anytime soon because they're like I think the the architecture of the internet itself needs to be different. Like the way TCP/IP packets and and redundancy is not conducive to like tons of data getting sent at at next to no latency. Um, so, but yeah, I think I like as as the world becomes more cloudified right like these things are going to advance so i think that's going to be the next big one in my mind cool and have you tried any of the vdb stuff or is that uh that's not a uh, in, in um horizon at the moment like bringing vdbs directly into unreal yeah we've messed with it a little bit um it, alembics is is sort of another flavor of that um vats has been a flavor so so one of the scenes in our demo reel we, we won a ves award for is 
uh, we kind of wrote tech kind of like that at Infinity Word, where where before you could have like a model that has a rig and some animation on it. If you wanted to do crazy destruction stuff, you know, you had to. Um, it was just a nightmare to like write a bunch of scripts to turn it into a bunch of independent models with animations and. Um, so we wrote an alembic like system that could just take you know arbitrary meshes over time and and you know play them back in the engine yeah i i think i think that is that stuff is 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 pretty huge it's 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 massive um you know it, the, the trick is like one of the one of the fun things about being in a game engine is that everything's real time right uh and the moment you go out of it, like now you're, you're you have to like have your data over there, and you're running a thing, and then bring it in, and it has to sync with what's in the engine, and sure. it 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 adds complexity, and and now you're back to the slow world of <laughs> seeing like it's funny that like me and other you know game guys, like our whole careers have been spent you know not waiting for anything. There's no there's no waiting for rendering. It's it's all. <laughs> happening 60 oh, yes. times a second <laughs> so like as i've as i've you know been sort of learning houdini and stuff it's like oh man waiting for anything is like it's torturous <laughs> to yeah. us game guys we're just not used to that yeah uh well that's awesome trying do you have any thoughts or questions no it was very interesting to to hear your viewpoint um and all this breakdown was very fascinating and then the talk oh. the, the real time because you know, because our background is film, which is you wait for everything. You don't see yeah. anything. Everything is gray. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the color or light takes, yeah. um, you know, hours <laughs> sometimes. So we're we're just like not efficient at all in, in Unreal yeah. because we're like, oh, let's still see it. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And and it kind of doesn't matter right like it, it, you in the end you're you're just rendering it out and it's fine if it's not real time it's kind of nice when it is and you're able to just see it at final quality while you're kind of flying around a space but it's still it's still pretty fast like we don't we're not 10 minute renders at all like we're yeah. still less than that no like it if we get a 10 minute render is when we go in and we crank up the motion blur samples crank up like if we just do it like just regular it's pretty it's, fast it's instant it's yeah. when we go in and crank everything all the way up that, to, to get that, more buttery images yeah. and stuff yeah um, but um it's i don't know we're just not even thinking about efficiency but it's like um but it's weird because even in film you do have to be efficient so there are a lot of things that i would never do uh and i'm i'm just going like really all out and unreal and then not even caring about any of it so yeah. it's just so crazy to it's kind of liberating, right? <laughs> it's liberating. You see everything right away. You see the polys. Um, you can light right away. You can do so much. You can have like 20 lights in the scene. So you know, rendering, you put extra. Each light you add, it takes longer to render. So Yeah, I, I wonder yeah. about that. Like like the move from rendered to real time for lighting artists specifically, I think is, is like, that's got to be like a huge boon for them, right? To be able to like... Literally, oh, it's huge! I it's can't like, picture going back. No, it's so waiting it's, for three minutes to see what like moving something slightly over is going to be like. Oh my goodness, I can't! Well, I can't even imagine. Lighting is so different. Like one, it's um, it's just it's not as artistic as you think in film because you try to get it look good, but it takes a long time just to even see what it looks like. Yeah. The changes, iterations are really slow, and then you spend the other time just optimizing your rendering, going, "Why is this flickering?" And then you're you're just adjusting settings and like how do you how do you make this faster how do you remove that flicker flicker is like a thing like right? yeah noise is just da dancing all over the screen and it doesn't stick mm -hmm. so a lot of times it's like just optimization um and lighting and whereas here is like that's gone you see everything right away lighting is so artistic um i mean i'm sure there's obviously everything has technical stuff to it well but. it's artistic in film too i think yeah. i think that's but, not the right word i think what it is it, it's not fun to do it's really yeah that's the word it is artistic yeah. but it's a lot of like it's just, just horrible it's yes. waiting sucks waiting and optimizing sucks yeah. So. yeah um let me show you guys this one more video uh i i 
oops, I'm recycling. Uh, this is an interesting showing of how a game engine renders. So this is taking a single frame, so a 60th of a second, and it's showing it draw over one minute. So every one of those little wireframes that's going is is populating you know the pixels at that place and there's sort of an order it goes in so it does the view model first this is a, a, a clip from modern warfare 3. the gun is at a different fov than the environment and then it's drawing what's called the the statics so objects that don't move uh, and then in a little bit, it'll get to the emissives, which are the things that have transparency. Actually, it'll go statics, which are opaque things that don't move. And then it'll do the animated things like vehicles. And then it'll get into the emissives in a moment, the things that have transparency to them. And the transparency stuff will drop back to front largely, uh, whereas the other ones don't need to hear this and then at the very end, it'll do the color correction and the UI. Uh, that's that's really cool. I've I've never seen seen this broken down like that. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, that's how you it came in. Not just a field of view. It's it's just uh, so like I'm assuming the environment is like like a 15 millimeter since it's got a wide field of view, and then they. Uh, they're just cheating the, the gun to look good because maybe a 15 millimeter wouldn't look good. Yeah, it would probably look weird, wouldn't it? it? <laughs> so. Yeah, there, there's a couple reasons that they do that. Uh, two of the main ones are, um, you know, as a player, you if, if you're holding, you know, a firearm out in front of you like that, and you go over to a wall, you know, you can technically stand up against the wall and, and, and your hands and gun <laughs> should be, like, going through. They don't have you, like, you know, the tip of your gun, like, bink, bump up the wall, stop you. They let you go right up to it. So it's kind of an optical fake in two parts. One is the FOV difference um, just helps it feel like there's kind of a, a fake, like a gap between stuff, even though you're technically through it. Uh, and the other and the other little trick to do is they just tell the, they call this the view model, the, the, the weapon in the hands. They have it draw... Um, they have it in a, it, it technically it draws first. You could think of it as drawing last, but uh, it was the first thing to draw, but it just draws over everything. No matter even if it is technically through something, it's just got a bucket that it's in that tells it to like, nothing can ever draw on top of this. Yeah, that's awesome. I really like seeing it break down like that. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, uh, is there anything else you wanted to show us, DJ? I think that's about it. I, I man, I got through it all pretty quick. Usually, it takes me a lot longer. <laughs> that was a lot of stuff. Yeah, it was a lot of information. Um, does anybody have any questions for DJ? Here's your chance, or Andrea, since we got him here too. Yeah. Yeah, Andreas is on the uh, Real Time VFX Discord all the time, answering all your questions, including mine. <laughs> Thanks, Andreas. <laughs> so that's uh let me find that again so so is that discord the same as this or this is a different thing? yeah let me uh let me let me give you a, a link to it right now that's a, that's a good idea let me bring yeah. it up is this cat from the that's from uh the unreal fellowship is that cat oh, the cat is who i play dungeons and dragons with <laughs> okay. Okay. we had <laughs> real yeah we had a, a cat that was in our team oh uh, okay so you're a D, D guy oh man you gotta see my D, &D room <laughs> gotta show photos i play uh i can bring him up if you want pull him up pull him up let's see all right we're doing it <laughs> uh let me post this in the chat i mean i don't know if you could tell from our background that we're into nerdy toy stuff so. <laughs> oh yeah uh okay we, uh, i actually collect dungeons and dragon toys from the 80s like the ljn figures yeah me too i just got a, a war duke oh nice yeah I want war duke players. looked so cool when we were kids and when you analyze him now you're like he's got like one leg totally out and he's wearing like pantyhose on the other one <laughs> <laughs> well the 
part of the the thing is um he's got a half a suit of armor that you now we're going D D lore <laughs> Uh, the intent of that design was to like kind of taunt his enemies. So, like, I don't even need a, a whole suit of armor. I just I'm that want a half, whatever. Uh, yeah, here is. So I just built this like late last year. That's where I play D and D. Oh, geez, that's wow. awesome. That looks really <laughs> nice. Actually, this is great. Yeah, uh, I built this table. My, my, and there's uh, like, is that where like that the screen on the table or is it, it is? It's a 60 inch TV. Uh, the laptop controls it. Uh, so you're the, I've got a sound. The, the dungeon master. Is that where the dungeon master <laughs> sits? Yeah. That's, yeah, awesome. that's where I sit. I'm usually the DM. I play in two games a week and I DM three or four games a week. <laughs> I've got voice filtering on the mic so I can do like pitch shifted demon voices and half wings and stuff. <laughs> I love the, the original artwork uh, in, on the back and the left. That's yeah, like those are those view. are both um, signed by Elmore. Oh, those are great. I remember as a kid, like without a doubt, one of the reasons why I got into doing monsters and, and like horror stuff was because my parents were like big time uh, born again Christians for, they had a moment, they got out of it, but during the 80s, it was the satanic panic, right? And it was like Dungeons and Dragons. If you play that one time, you are going to, it's going to be the same as The Exorcist. You will be. Oh, no. <laughs> so when yeah. I would go to the bookstore, I'd go to that, the role playing section, and I felt like I, I should not be there. And I would just look at the artwork, and it was so fascinating. And when you're a little kid, you start looking at the, through the book, and it just feels like spells. Do you know what I mean? Because you see all these numbers and the dice, and you're like, this is, this is fucking witchcraft. So. Yeah, my uh, same thing here. My dad, we you know, we were raised Mormon uh, as kids, and my dad made me throw out. He, he made me give him. He, he made an offer. I I don't know what would happen had I refused, but um, yeah, he gave me twenty bucks to take and, and destroy all of my books, which is kind of what led to this room actually. Like during COVID, like I was kind of getting nostalgia for like, man, I miss those old books. So I started like collecting them on ebay again and it just it went <laughs> it went bonkers. um awesome. this little one on the, the the little black one on the left were palace of the vampire queen the first ever D, &D adventure published even even the floor work i know <laughs> <laughs> oh well, look at the top too these are these are uh, dead players i i have got a deceased stamp that whenever a player dies <laughs> it's like brutal bam i <laughs> just mark them deceased this is really, really <laughs> and cool. then put them on the ceiling oh, that's awesome and what's that stuff on the on the on the right like the books are those just yes like so yeah this is my collection so from the top left there is 1971 or two's chainmail and then this white, this is called the white box set. That is the 1974 rules. Yeah. Uh, where is... Those are some of the first ones, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're going to be playing with those rules. And then, oh, man. Okay, we're going... Yeah, can we go down the, the rabbit hole? Yeah, show some stuff. <laughs> okay. Alex uh, is a D and d guy, the owner of Noman. So, uh, Alex? Yeah, he's uh, appreciating it. He actually wrote... <laughs> What's up, Alex? I don't know if you remember me, but we met in the very early days of uh, of Nomen. You came to Viewpoint Digital and taught us how to rig. Uh, yeah, I, I remember that fondly. Um, so so yeah, these are the these are this OD and D, then the the three different basic sets: Holmes, Molve, and Metzer. Uh, and then first edition, revised first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then this whole area is my first and second edition modules. I've got about half or two thirds of them. I t printed out tiny little uh, one inch module covers <laughs> so you can see what's like on the shelf behind it. Uh, these are the basic ones. These are Judges Guild uh, modules, which is what's across the, the back here. These are. Uh, there was a gap in time where D&D uh, &D had come out, but they hadn't published the first modules yet, and TSR let these companies make adventure. So I'm starting a Vidge game using the 74 rules and the oldest adventures ever published. 
So that should be kind of fun. That's amazing. Yeah, it actually sounds like a lot of fun. So you see yeah. kids, if you do good in the facts, you can have your own dungeon and dragon room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Do a facts <laughs> that you too can make a D and D table. Yeah. Here we yeah. go. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that's cool. Um, any any questions? Um, you can ask about the Dungeon Dragons room. <laughs> let's see. Yeah. I'm gonna play D and D with some fellow no. All right, do it. I love it. I'm just yeah. It's pretty popular, um, at least the people I know. <laughs> Kat says it's so organized. It is for. It's a beautiful room. It's a it's a beautiful. It's gorgeous. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So yeah, Kat's, has, Kat's one of my players. <laughs> oh, is she? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any questions for DJ about effects or his Dungeons & Dragons room? <laughs> no, <it's laughs> a well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. I love, I, love, I love doing this stuff. I love talking about it. Uh, yeah, this fire pack has been really fun to put out. I'm just really stoked to see you guys using it. Yeah, we're, we're very happy, we're and very thanks happy. so much. Because when we did have an issue, we we reached out to uh, actually Apex. Uh, you you jumped on it and helped us out, so we appreciate that. Um, we love it. Uh, you know, when when one of, one of my big worries, I'm a big noob guy, and when we first started doing the project, I was like, real time fire is going to look crappy. I want this to. I want to comp in the fire, and then when I found the action VFX, I was like, damn, that looks really freaking good. So. Well, it is filmed. <laughs> it is essentially comped. <laughs> well, I, I think what you, it's not only though, because you got the smoke and everything about it works. It's like the embers, all of that stuff. It, there's more than just, because we've actually tried bringing in like just media files and popping them in there. And, and your look, thing has like true depth. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful pack. Yeah, it is a very beautiful pack. Thank you. Thank and you. We're, we're use, proud of it. Um, we get questions like, do you use a lot of marketplace stuff? And we're like, no. Um, yeah, your, for, stuff, except like, for your, <laughs> your stuff really stands out, and it made us re, you know, reassess. Like, damn, real time VFX really is a beautiful thing, and when it's done right, there's a, the thing is the marketplace is a tricky place, right? You have some gorgeous stuff, and then you have less than gorgeous stuff, and that's the same. You know, you go on Turbo Squid and you look for 3D models. The same thing. There's going to be amazing models. Some models that look good, and then when you get them, they're a topological mess. But your stuff is beautiful, so yeah. Yeah, it's a, it looks really great, and we use it <laughs> so much. All right, <laughs> awesome. And yeah. look for more. We're we we've already started on the next packs. Yeah, the, our our goal or hope is is to like, you know, literally make make stuff that will last the test of time. That is that is like our goal is to make it next to impossible to do better than it. Like our intent is to make this the the you know, as, as realistic, as high quality, as humanly possible using just straight up film stuff. So I do uh, have one question. Uh, yeah. So you were talking about bringing in like the rain pack, which is something that we're very interested in. For yeah. When you said stuff. the other stuff, I was like, well, <laughs> rain, rain. <laughs> yeah. So how would, you use, how would you use footage for that? Because like, how would you separate it to different depth? Yeah. So, all in effects. So I rain mean, is is bad. is a tricky one. Um, so, man, I I could I could go off on a, on a pretty big tangent about this. So there's a couple different parts to rain, right? There is the stuff in air that is flying. There is what it looks like after it's hit glass. There's what it looks like on the ground, on concrete or dirt. There is what the tree that is saturated wet from rain looks like with it, it sort of the, the you know, the, or, or the wall of a building as, as the water is sort of cascading down it. Um, there is the lens effects that you might want to do for like if you, the player, are walking around a space, you know, you could, like if you look at surf videos where the guy is out there with the cam in the water and the little drops and blurs that are going down the lens. So there's so I mean, you could talk about each each bit of that. How do you handle it? The 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 environment response is an important part of it. Like it's not going to ground unless you get this like like this fire slightly reflected in the ground makes it feel like a, a kind of a wet ground. Right. So 
you know, what is what is wet ground with little radial droplets and and is, is the water running? And so there's a lot, there's one whole side of it is sort of the environment surface material shader stuff. Um, but then the, the, talking about the stuff in air, um, you could, you know, like this fire pack, right? Like the smokes there are not filmed. They are, they're simulated to get them to sort of like properly loop and do the same thing over time. And, and they don't look like, quite they look good but not like ultra realistic just kind of sitting there by themselves but then you know when when you treat them and combine them and have them feed from something and into each other like you when you have nice lighting on them and normals and everything okay you know now the whole thing looks good in aggregate um so you know what of it is is actually from filmed footage it, it probably won't be just like you know they set up they on a stage and they filmed stuff and then we just like give you a card that's got a bunch of rain on it because like what's the distance is the camera moving from it you know those are all questions so like this we'll probably just sort of deconstruct their footage into elements right like all of these sparks were in their footage and we just photoshopped a little frame of it <laughs> and then put it in this first cell and that's kind of how you do game effects right and then you play them back on these little embers that are flying around so the, none of that is film stuff but it comes from film source um so if we can get the raindrops you know that are streaking or still depending on how high speed the camera was we, we will try to use as much film stuff as possible for, for textures. And then they will go on particles that live in the scene and have a little refraction. You know, there's a bunch of shader work. Like if I, sh I didn't show you the shaders behind all of these fires, but there's a ton of stuff going on for how they clip and fade and Fresnel and, and have controls for brightness and all that. Um, so when I've done rain in the past, some of the best rain I've done in a game engine, there was a SIGGRAPH research paper where someone did like, it, it was it was intended for like compositing, but I remember the, the study of like the oscillation of raindrop shapes and how when lights from a, a variety of angles around it results in like these kind of weird streaks. So it may be that, that we sort of like use things like that research paper for the textures, or we'll probably try them both. We'll probably try like just comping out, you know, rubber stamping, like, and, and these texture sheets, we, we call these, there, there's kind of two kinds, right? There's, there's the, the texture atlas where you saw, you know, each frame of the fire in rows and columns, we, we'll call that a flip book. And then terminology can vary, but, an atlas or a texture sheet like this where you're really just using each of these as a single still for variance not for time or animation just because they because if you use the same exact one every time i mean these are all just a, a a dot right like we could use radial gradient but doesn't feel there's quite right to, feel, there's more to it than just that there yeah there's complexity yeah. even though there's just subtle differences in color and like center weighting and some imperfection stuff in there right but you use it and it just doesn't feel so generic and fake it just adds that little bit of real so we'll probably do stuff like that for the rain too where you know we want we'll probably have all the controls right what 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 shutter speed are you using for how much is it going to streak and and uh i'm really excited about doing like the the best like wet glass where it fogs up and then i think some of the Forza games probably have some of the best of this I've seen where like even the speed of the car and if you're turning or not affects like how the drops that have hit it and are clearing the fogged blurry bit like like can can do arcs and like crazy stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, all that stuff we're going to do. We're going to do all that. as much film footage as we can use as possible. I, I think that makes it more great. But, you know, just whatever it takes to, to do, make something killer and realistic yeah one thing i will say about the fire and then i'll let you go that i do appreciate is i know that when you grab the when i grab the action vfx footage and i apply it into a comp directly 
they shot it under, they underexpose it so that there's all the complexity and the texture. But your shader work, doing all the work that I would do in Nuke, like I would bring up the gain, I would add the glows to it, because fire always has to look kind of overexposed um, in order to look right. But that's not the way the action effects gives it to you. They underexpose it. But so all of that stuff is in your in your shader work, which looks great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Put a, a lot of effort into that. Yeah. And as you said, like you've got a really nice dynamic range of values. So you get a ton of detail in these. Yeah. But then when you see it over here, it's just it looks like just hot and bright and glowy yeah. and you lose a lot of that. But that's that's how it looks that's on it film. Looks. So so that, you know, that's what we do. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so if anybody has some last questions for DJ, if not, uh, let them go. Yeah, this is your chance, guys. Your chance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I was an effects artist, I would. Be <laughs> good, good suggestion, Andreas, too, on using uh, the depth blend offset uh, from the alpha. I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. That sounds that sounds cool. So that's great. Cat's gonna bring dry ice uh, to your. <laughs> Great idea. You know what? I've always wanted to have like a dry ice thing in my house because I'm cheesy like that. And I hear <laughs> you don't have good ventilation, like it'll knock you out because it just. <laughs> yeah, it, it becomes a lot. I have uh, two dry ice machines and a little mini tiny one. Oh, that's uh, awesome. I think, I think they're at my, my other place, though. I totally, I totally <laughs> want one of those. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing that for our next D&D like &D session. Like, like, I'm the guy, look at all the toys behind me. So I'm, we both have issues. So, yeah. <laughs> so, well, dude, awesome. Uh, you're badass. And now I have even more respect for you when I saw the D&D &D room. So. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you're all here. And thank you so much for coming in today. Yes, thank you so much. It was all really fascinating. Everything. Awesome. Thanks uh, for having me, guys. I, I thank you for coming on. Talking totally to you appreciate it. Uh, we have like five minutes left, so uh, I'm just gonna went over last week. Uh, we're guys go. So unless anybody has any questions for us or for Tran, uh, Alex says he really enjoys it. So Alex is making all this possible. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. And, um, Thanks, Alex. Good to see you again, man. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> all right, guys. So we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Hang in there, DJ, one second.